welcome. Uh, looks like we're a little bit, uh, a little bit sh short on numbers. Maybe we'll we'll get up to full strength soon. Uh, so ha happy Wednesday. Uh, start us off. Uh, prefect session tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there's any prefect session tonight from eight thirty to nine thirty. Um, I shifted it by thirty minutes because I have to attend a CSU fifty four. Um, but aside from that, um, you know, I'm expecting questions on the kitty trees, because those can be a little bit tough. Um, and yeah, there will be snacks, and uh, please come by. Um, be there, be square, and green square is the only place. All right, thank you. Uh, what questions do you have about um, the, the different kinds of trees we've been looking at, uh, the lab, uh, to get us started? All right, in that case, let's get right into a bit of practice. Uh, we have another situation where we need to choose a data structure to use. Here we want a patient registry. Uh, that could keep track of patient names and the date of their next appointment. And we want patients to be able to look up when their next appointment is. So think about what data structure would you use uh, to implement these operations. Uh, there's been some movement toward hash table. Uh, that is uh, indeed what uh, what I would choose for this for this situation. Um, someone share your thinking on on hash table, Ron. Uh, you want to correlate two pieces of data, and also the order doesn't matter, and you want the search to be really fast. Exactly. Very well. Well put. That we have related pieces of data. Like given one of them, say the name, we want to look up the appointment date. We want that to be fast, and we don't need to keep the patients in any particular order. We just want to do this looking up. Elena. If you did a balance tree, and then it like alphabetically, would that, why would that be faster since there would be like splitting? So uh, that's, that's a, a, a good point. If we wanted to be able to say, Give me all the patients whose name starts with A. Uh, or, um, uh, uh, or find me the patient whose name is most similar, like is alphabetically closest to this particular name. Uh, then we're, this kind of logarithmic search through the tree is going to be helpful. But if we just want to say, given a name, give me the information about this patient. Uh, the hash table can use the name as the key in constant time, go to the array index where that patient is. Uh, the balanced binary search tree, we have to like do log in kind of searches through the tree. So with hash table, you don't need to like iterate for all the together? Uh, exactly. Like our, our, the, the hash table is, is really useful because we can kind of use our hash function of the key to get to the array index where that key is stored. Okay. So we kind of don't, don't need to search at all. It's not like starting at zero and like going at based on the key. Uh, so yeah, that we're, this, this is sort of constant time under the assumption that kind of however we're managing the size of the hash table and the collisions between keys that happen to be the same, if we're doing that in a reasonable way, uh, then, yeah, we're going to get constant time. If, um, if we have a small hash table and we don't ever expand it and there's tons and tons of keys, uh, then maybe we wouldn't get this performance. But certainly if you're using Java's hash map, uh, you can kind of rely on, on this constant time. In Does Java's like hash map automatically handle Collisions, like we never really do with that. Uh, yes, so I don't know. 
Let's see if they tell us. Um, yeah, so they are saying that it's tracking the load factor kind of of the slots in the hash table, how many are currently filled. Um, and it will kind of automatically grow the table if it gets close to too full. Um, looks like default is 0.75. Um, I, yeah, I don't see that they're actually telling us exactly how it's handling collisions, whether it's like separate chaining or that probing of kind of just looking for the next available spot. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's an implementation detail that they are probably deliberately not mentioning because they don't want us to make any assumptions about the hash map based on this internal detail that could change in the future. Um, so what they tell us in this documentation is the stuff that they kind of guarantee about the behavior, and there may be things that they don't tell us, like exactly how collisions are handled, that they kind of want to be free to change if they need to. But yeah, it will absolutely handle collisions, and that, but they do warn us that uh, if you if we have a lot of if we have a bad hash code that just like returns the same number for a bunch of different objects, um, then the hash table performance will suffer, which indeed we would expect with a bad hash function. <clears throat> Other questions? All right, one. Uh, one other uh, exercise for you to review a bit of this is not right. We did this. Here we go. Let's do a bit of AVL practice. So have a tree here that I claim is unbalanced. Uh, and I have four possible rotations we might do to restore the balance of the tree. Uh, so I'd like you to think about which of these four would, uh, would solve our, our balance problem. All right, you've had a chance to look over this. Uh, can we balance this tree with a single rotation? No, we're in a situation here where we can't actually balance. There's no single rotation we can do that will actually balance this tree. Um, and we, where in this tree is our balance issue? Liam? At 23. Uh, why, why at 23? Um, I guess it's left node, or it's left, left child is null, so that's height of negative one. And it's right child is height of one. Exactly. The 23 has unbalanced children, so this is what we need to fix. And what arrangement of these three values would give us are the kind of balanced arrangement that we want? Marcus? Maybe if Nifty replace where 23 is right now, and 23 is the left node of uh, 50. Exactly. That we, we want the middle value of these three to be in the middle of them, which will give us, give us uh, this balance. Uh, and so we both need to rotate 50 to the right and then rotate it to the left. We'll give us 50 here, 23 to his left, and 71 uh, to its right. Hey, so when you say like rotate, just to like visualize it, if you rotate 50 to the right, does that mm -hmm. swap where 50 and 71 are? Yeah, if we have 23, uh, and then uh, we currently have 71 and 50, a rotate right means uh, move the node that we're rotating to its parent and then make its parent the right child. Okay. 
that's kind of the rotate right part. And this kind of still a, a valid kind of binary search tree. Uh, and then rotate left says, again, make the node we're rotating uh, its parent, and then make the parent its left child. Uh, and then we'd end up with our kind of that part of the tree looking like this. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So that was a bit of review on our, our self-balancing trees. Um, last time, uh, I made a big deal about how it was President's Day, and then I didn't even talk about a president. It was, it was humiliating. Uh, so I'm going to take the opportunity now to talk about uh, William Taft. Um, you may remember that uh, he uh, was um, president after, after Theodore Roosevelt. He has an interesting kind of career where uh, he, he went into law and he was appointed to a, a, uh, as a federal judge. Uh, and he, his kind of driving ambition was he wanted to be on the Supreme Court. Uh, and during William McKinley's term, McKinley brings Taft to the White House. Taft is excited that maybe he's going to be appointed to the Supreme Court. But no, McKinley wanted Taft to go be governor of the Philippines, because you may remember uh, the Spanish-American War uh, uh, in the late 1890s. Uh, the U.S. annexes the, the Philippines, among other places, and now the uh, war for independence that uh, people in the Philippines had started when it was controlled by the Spanish continues now that the Americans are kind of the new imperial um, uh, power uh, trying to, to govern the Philippines. Taft goes there to try and set up a, a civilian government, does make some progress on that. Um, and then Roosevelt is, uh, and it, Taft doesn't end up being appointed to the Supreme Court by McKinley because McKinley is shot. And then uh, Roosevelt, again, wants Taft to, to come do a, do a job in Washington, but it's not the Supreme Court. Uh, Roosevelt wants Taft to be Secretary of War and says, look, if you do this for me, I will, I will appoint you to the Supreme Court. Um, so off Taft goes, and here we have a, a political cartoon uh, of Roosevelt here, uh, kind of uh, uh, promoting Taft as, as a kind of a new, new shiny thing uh, in his administration. Uh, and uh, when Roosevelt decides not to run for another term, Taft is kind of his chosen successor. He sees Taft not as someone who's going to have an independent agenda of his own, but someone who kind of take good care of Roosevelt's policies as he, as he hands them off. Um, Roosevelt uh, is quickly disappointed in Taft. Um, I'm sure his, his ego had a lot to do with it, um, not being president anymore. Um, uh, Taft also, um, like Roosevelt, gets a lot of uh, praise for, for taking on monopoly power in the US, but Taft actually in practice does a fair bit more of it uh, than Roosevelt did. But when it comes for time for Taft to run for re-election, Roosevelt challenges him for the nomination. Roosevelt loses, and he says, I feel as strong as a bull moose, and uh, goes and runs as a third party, the progressive candidate. So you have here a bull moose with Roosevelt's um, notable like smile and, and pierce glasses. Uh, and uh, the outcome of this is the two... Uh, uh, Roosevelt in, in green and Taft in red split the 50% of the vote for the Republicans and the Democrat Woodrow Wilson uh, wins with 42% of the vote. So Roosevelt um, uh, uh, ran on this, uh, at the time, very progressive platform and a lot of things he said during this campaign would be taken up by his, uh, uh, by his relative Franklin Roosevelt a couple decades later. All right, so we've we've uh, corrected my my um, uh, presidential omission uh, of last time. So actually, uh, there's one final kind of well, uh, there's two new kinds of trees that I want to talk about today. One uh, for the uh, quiz that is out today, and one. Um, which will support a, a new kind of abstract data type that we'll, we'll get into. But uh, one 
thing that I'm sure you found uh, useful uh, as you uh, uh, implement um, uh, stuff in Java is that when you say um, uh, start start typing, let's say uh, we have a um, uh, we we have a, a 2D uh, 2D point P is new point uh, 2D and then I wonder well what methods does uh, uh, P uh, this point have and it sort of fills in kind of here are some possibilities of thing I've started typing X here's some things that like have X uh, uh, in them and what I want to talk about today is uh, how we might do this sort of uh, find kind of possible completions to what someone has started typing in an efficient way uh, and this comes up all the time if you start typing in a, a Google search it might Kind of offer different completions. We see it in VS Code. Uh, and we're in particular going to consider um, so given some prefix. So for example, what if we had H O? What are possible words that HO could, could lead to? Like what suggestions should we give to someone to like maybe you're typing house or home or uh, howdy or kind of whatever it is. Um, where, have, where have prefixes come up before in this class? Oh, huh? model. Yeah, with Boggle, we had to think about prefixes. And, and does anyone remember kind of what what data structure or how we used prefixes in that lab? In recursive backtracking. Yeah, we use them as part of the recursive backtracking. And in particular, uh, we maybe had some had some string so far uh, that we were searching in the Boggle board. And how were we using that? Like related to prefixes. Yeah, we were saying like, is this string so far a prefix of any word in the dictionary? It's like, could this be the start of a, a real word we could find? And to facilitate that, we had this kind of big set of all the the prefixes in the dictionary, um, and we're and. In the lab, we weren't asking what are the possible words. We were asking, like, just does this prefix show up anywhere in the dictionary, true or false? Um, if we wanted to say, given this prefix, what are the words in the dictionary that it could be the start of? Uh, what would we have needed to do to answer that question, to, to get this list of possible words? Yeah, we want to return all the words that start with HO, and we have our, our dictionary. So, how would we get that list of words? Peter? You could store the prefixes in a hash table where their values were a hash table or all the words that had that prefix. Yeah, we could, uh, uh, we could kind of have a data structure that kind of ahead of time stores all this information, uh, but to get that list of words in the first place for each prefix. Yeah. Do you need a list of suffixes? Uh, I don't think we need a list of suffixes. I mean, what I'm getting for, yeah, Elia? Are you going to the long card, like the asterisk, or the Um. Yeah, so so 
if we were kind of typing something into into a search bar, we might put an asterisk over the, after this to indicate HO followed by anything is what we're looking for. But what I'm getting at is we would have to have looped through every word in the dictionary and checked each one. Does it start with HO? And this is all to say that in this class, we generally want to look at some problem that we can currently solve by just searching every, like searching all the possible things and then do better than that by somehow having a new data structure or a different algorithm that is going to avoid just searching through all the things. So that's what this new tree is going to be all about. Um, so uh, to generate a kind of set of, uh, of words in our dictionary, we're going to have house, home, Uh, hope, hound, hose, yeah, that looks good. Um, and so HO, that would say, you know, all five of these words could be possible words. Uh, but if I go to HOU, now I want to just say it's house and hound are the possible words. So our, our data structure for solving this is the tree as it was intended to, like the creator of it said from retrieval is where they came up with this name. I've always said it as pronounced like try because saying it like tree, it's just verbally, you can't tell that it's different from T-R-E-E. -E. Uh, but the, uh, one of the people who came up with this called it a tree. I call it a try, spelled T-R-I-E. Also goes by the, it's also sometimes called a prefix tree, uh, which is why, which is suggestive of why we might use it to solve this problem. So main points here So each nodes node is going to store a single character a list of children and this is an important difference of this kind of structure compared to any of the trees that we've talked about so far. We've always talked about trees that have a, a specific number of children, just left or right, or uh, the KD tree also just left or right or up or down. But our tri nodes can have any, will have a, a, a list, a variable number of children in this case. Uh, and the last will also store whether the node is a word. So let me actually draw with these five words what our try would look like, give you a sense of of what's going on. So each, each node is going to store a letter. And uh, here we'll, we'll start with um, uh, our, our letter, um, uh, a letter H. And this will have um, only one child because all of our words currently have H O after them. And then O will have a child for each different letter that comes after O in the words in our dictionary. And so we'll have uh, uh, M, we'll have 
P, we'll have S and U. And M has E, and I'll represent with a red check mark. We will mark the node E as saying this is a word because it is the end of the word H-O-M-E. Our word P has an E come after it in hope. S has an E come after it in hose. U, we have hound and house. And all of these leaves would be marked with, yes, this is this is a word. Karen. So even if pop is a word, is it, you wouldn't have a check because it's not the end of that specific word? Um, yes, good question. Uh, I was thinking of a dictionary with just these five words. Uh, but yes, we could add hop to our dictionary. Uh, in which case, P would also be marked, yes, this is the end of a word. No, I <clears throat> so when we're checking whether or not a word, I mean, a character leads to a word, do we have to, like, backtrack which node come from there, or how would we, like, start that? that? Yeah, so how would we actually use this tree? And so let's say we have the given prefix H-O-U. And so... Starting at the top, uh, I mean, and, and the way that I, I have drawn this is a little misleading. Um, I've drawn it the way that you'll work with this in the quiz, but we, we would actually need a root node that doesn't have any characters so that it could have uh, kind of every different letter as a child, because not every word necessarily starts with H. So H wouldn't be the, the root if we were doing this for real, but for simplicity, we'll just say we, we have a dictionary exclusively of words that start with H. Um, so given H-O-U, we would say, all right, we see H here, good so far. Uh, does it have a children, have any children that match the next letter, that match O? Uh, it does, so we go here. Then we say, does this have any children that mix, match the next letter in our prefix? That's U. All right, we've found a path that matches our, our entire prefix. And so now everything that's a descendant of U that is marked as a word is a possible completion of H-O-U. So if someone had typed in H-O-U, we would then kind of search all the children of U to find all the nodes that, start, that are marked as a word, and we'd say, okay, there's hound and there's house. Uh, and we'd say, these are the possible completions of H-O-U. These are the possible words that could be formed starting with H-O-U in our dictionary. Uh, and we avoided having to search, having to check whether home, hope, hop, or hose was a valid, was a possible word because we kind of followed our tree and, and kind of didn't need to search those. Does that make sense? Aiden? So it says like each node stores a list of children. So is it like a list or is it just like another node? Or is there like no difference? Um, yeah, so let's take a look at some code. Get out of here. So I'll just open up this quiz handout. Um, and to kind of start from the beginning. We would have our try class. Oh, I should actually turn on the screen, perhaps. Uh, we would have our, our uh, try class, uh, and we would want a try node. And the things that we want at each node are uh, a, uh, a character, uh, we want a list of 
trinodes. So this is an array list or a linked list that just has all the nodes that are a child of this node because it may be one, it may be four, it may be zero. Um, and then a Boolean uh, indicating whether it is whether this node is the end of, of a word or not. Um, yeah, so we, we need some we need some data structure that is like flexible in size. Another way this is implemented is you might have an array uh, of length 26, kind of one slot for each letter, and each slot is either null or the node corresponding to a particular letter is, is the, the other way that, that tries are often implemented. Um, but easier for us to just use use a list. Other questions? No, no. Well, um, sort of as a segue to this, I understand that like web engines sort of use cache to determine which word to actually pop up on the screen whenever you type them. So how do they exactly know which one would mostly like pertain to whatever you want to look up or something like that? Um, so that information is, is like proprietary and like uh, very valuable. So I, I can't tell you exactly what um, say Google does. Uh, but I can make some guesses, um, which is they are recording everything everyone ever searches. Um, and so they can build a data structure that says a search that says, how do I am? They can say, OK, what is the most frequent completed search that begins how do I and then the letter M? And they fill in kind of the most uh, frequently searched um, query that starts with those characters. Uh, they probably also take into account where are you geographically located, uh, any data, they like, are you signed into a Google account, anything that they know about you, so that instead of what is the most frequently searched thing across the entire world, it's like what is the most frequently searched thing like in your state or in your town uh, by people like you, um, based on whatever information they have about you. Uh, so. Like they have some algorithm for ranking the kind of likeliness of like how likely is the search to be completed with these versus these these other options. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, when it comes to algorithms, would you use the same method to uh, determine their efficiency as we're doing, like as we're doing with data structures, or is there something else that would be like more efficient to determine the efficiency of an algorithm? Um, in, in computer science, we'll analyze uh, the efficiency of a, a data structure and an algorithm exactly the same way. We'll look at the size of the input, how much work does it do, and put it in kind of worst case, average case terms. Other questions? So the other... Uh, the other part of the, the, the try for the quiz, um, uh, actually in this case, uh, I've made the, the children a, a hash map so that you can, given a character, look up the node that, like given, like if we're at HO and we have the character P, we would, P would be the key in the hash map and uh, the node with P would be the value associated. So we can take a character and look up in the hash map uh, which child we should go to. Um, and I've also implemented an insert uh, method for the try, um, which takes in a string word and just goes through each character in that word and uh, uh, so if we were to insert a new word, uh, hello, into our try, we would uh, start with hello, our overall root wouldn't be null. Um, and we would start with the character H, and we would say, does our, does our, um, node kind of contain, does our, our root node contain an, an entry for H? It does. Uh, so then update our current to be that node. Then we would get to E and we'd say, does node H have a child that corresponds to E? 
Uh, it doesn't, so we're going to kind of put a new entry into our hash map for E and then set current equal to that child. And then we would continue, create a new node for L, a new node for L, and a new node for O. And when we finally kind of get through all the characters in our word down to some, down to some leaf, we then mark current word is true. So your task for the quiz is given some tree that has had words inserted into it uh, and some prefix, return a list of the possible words that start with that prefix. Uh, and that, and you're putting in code the process that uh, I described where you are kind of keep looking for children that match kind of the next character of the string. And then once you are all the way through the prefix, you then should uh, kind of recursively go through all the descendants and every node that is marked as having a word. That's a word. That's something you add to the list. Elena. Uh, so you are searching the prefix tree. Yes. Yeah, so the, the tree is already made. Uh, the the kind of the nodes and the method for inserting things is already defined. And you are given a prefix, searching the tree for uh, uh, the. Um, for the the word the possible words that could start with that prefix. Any other questions on the try? All right. I will mention the other quiz question is implementing the an equals method on the BST on the binary search tree class. So this is given the current tree and some other tree return true or false whether they are equal, meaning they need to have all the same nodes with all the same keys and values in the same structure. Um, so uh, I think for, for both of these problems, a recursive helper method uh, is probably going to be useful, as will be true for most of the KD tree methods as well. All right, we are uh, caught up on things that, that were not talked about last time. Um, so that must mean that it's time for a new president. Um, this one, Woodrow Wilson. So. Uh, winner with 42% of the vote. Um, interesting, the first, uh, the first Southerner to be elected president since Zachary Taylor in 1848. Uh, and the, the only, uh, I believe the only president uh, elected who was a, uh, a citizen of the Confederacy uh, since Woodrow Wilson was uh, a kid growing up in Virginia during the Civil War. Um, Wilson was, to, to put, it, put it bluntly, very racist. Um, he instituted a lot of segregation in the federal government. He uh, had written, a, uh, he was a kind of historian and, uh, and professor uh, before he got into politics, and he had written a popular history of the U.S. that was very sympathetic to the, the cause of the, the th southern states in the Civil War. Um, he was very progressive in, in other ways. He pushed a lot of um, kind of uh, rights for, for workers um, and kind of trying to uh, uh, to kind of help um, uh, poorer folks uh, in the U.S. Um, but what he's often remembered for is his kind of idealistic view of the role the U.S. could play in the world um, after the U.S. joined World War One. Uh, Wilson was promoting this idea of kind of making the world safe for democracy, letting people decide uh, for themselves, kind of would they want to be their own country or part of some empire. Um, and he and kind of the three uh, other leaders of the, of the winning countries in the war, uh, you have Wilson here, Georges Clemenceau of France, 
uh, uh, Orlando, Prime Minister Orlando of, of Italy and Lloyd George of the United Kingdom. I've decided uh, a lot about kind of what countries would exist, what would their borders be, who would get what um, after, after the war ended. Um, and one of the big things that came out of this was the League of Nations, this sort of pre-UN organization uh, that Wilson tried very hard, uh, tried to get the United States to join, but uh, the United States Senate was having none of it. Um, uh, there was also criticism of of Wilson uh, and that there, uh, this is a, a political cartoon um, after uh, racial violence in uh, East St. Louis, where uh, 40 to uh, 150 African Americans were killed. Uh, and here Wilson is holding, uh, the world must be safe for democracy. Uh, and the caption on this was something like, uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, can we make democracy safe at home first? Um, and when he was out uh, promoting the League of Nations, trying to get it get the U.S. to join, he suffered a massive stroke and was completely paralyzed uh, on the left side of his body. Um, he continued being president, and they kind of covered up how disabled he was uh, from this stroke. Uh, when he would meet with congressional leaders, it was for a max of five minutes because he had a lot of trouble focusing. His judgment wasn't very good. Um, and his first wife had died shortly after he was elected, and he fell in love and, and married uh, another woman, uh, uh, Edith Wilson. Uh, and here's a kind of posed photograph uh, the first one after his stroke, where he's signing a paper, but his left side is totally paralyzed, so she's holding the paper steady uh, as he as he signs it. Um, and because she took over kind of secretly so many of his responsibilities after this stroke, uh, she is sometimes called the the first woman, uh, uh, first female president, um, because she kind of uh, in some ways ran ran the government in Wilson's last year in office. Okay. That's our presidential facts. So, I have some scenarios, uh, some, some things we might want uh, a computer to, uh, to help, help manage. Um, Uh, one example would be uh, people are coming into, patients are coming into an emergency room and there's someone who's evaluating kind of how serious is uh, uh, whatever ailment they have uh, and the emergency room personnel wants to triage, wants to kind of treat the people who have the most serious injuries or problems first. Um, And you can imagine this, uh, a computer system having some, being given some information about, about patients to, to help with this, this triage. Um, uh, we might also consider uh, my, my laptop right now is doing a whole bunch of, of different things. It's kind of displaying stuff. Uh, on on the screen, it's uh, I can see that it's it's getting a little data from uh, from the internet. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, potentially receiving Slack messages or email or, or whichever, um, and all these different things that the computer might need to do. Some of them might be more urgent or more important than others, uh, and so we might want the computer to be able to kind of decide which thing it's going to do next based on which is the most urgent. Um, some giving, giving different tasks the computer has to do, some kind of priority. Um, uh, another example would be uh, if we analyze some text, uh, there is some, and we want to compress it, like put it in a, a zip file or, or uh, shrink down the, the size of it. Uh, there are techniques that rely on selecting the most frequently occurring symbol in that text. 
uh, uh, in order to, to uh, identify the most effective uh, compressions that could be done. Um, and kind of what do all of these examples have in common? Luke? There's some sort of prioritization one over the other. Exactly. That in all of these, we want to choose the kind of the highest priority thing. Um, and this is distinct from, say, putting everything in order. Like, when we're choosing the highest priority, we don't necessarily care or need to know what the next highest priority is. We just care about, give me the currently the highest priority thing. Um, and there is an abstract data type, um, a kind of conceptual uh, uh, data type that we uh, would use in this sort of situation, which is called a priority queue, perhaps unsurprisingly. And our priority queue abstract data structure, uh, we're going to be able to add things to the priority queue. We're going to be able to get the minimum thing. And I'm saying minimum here uh, because priority-wise, I'm thinking in terms of uh, the, the, the highest priority thing would be priority number one. Uh, priority one would be the most important thing uh, on down to priority 999 on down to priority infinity. But one being kind of the, the highest priority. So that's why I write get min as something that priority Q will do, uh, it will get uh, get the sort of priority one thing before the priority two thing before the priority three thing. Um, does that make sense? Why this would be why we would want the the minimum? All right. So we want to get them in. We want to remove them in, and we want to check. Is there anything left in our priority queue with some kind of is empty operation? So if we were so if we were to do this with an array or a BST, um, I would like you to brainstorm uh, with your neighbors for uh, three, uh, two or three minutes, kind of what, uh, if we used an array or a BST, to kind of keep track of what is the minimum thing and then also be able to add new things and what the, uh, what the big O efficiency of these three operations would be if we, say, used an array, uh, uh, an unsorted array, uh, or a, a balanced, balanced binary search tree. <clears throat> I guess get min and remove min here are basically the, the same. So um, add versus getting the minimum. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about uh, these. So uh, to add a, a new element to our priority queue, if we were using an unsorted array, uh, suggestions on what that efficiency might be.
Hear him? Uh, what do we comes Because you don't need to put it anywhere. I said you just need to like add at the very end. Exactly. We can just stick it on the end. That's constant time. Uh, how about uh, removing or, or finding the minimum in our unsorted array? Right. Remove your um, linear, actually, because the minimum could be at the very end of the array. Exactly. We, it's not in sorted order. We have to search the whole thing to find, find the minimum. Uh, if we have kept our, our array in sorted order, these just flip. Now to like find, uh, the, to, to put a new thing into sorted order and kind of shift everything uh, over to make room for it, that's going to be linear. But in a sorted array, kind of finding the minimum is constant. It's always at the start. How about our balanced binary search tree? Liam? Um, I think it would be take a log and uh... Exactly. We add something to a balanced tree. We kind of find our way to uh, a leaf. We know that's log of n. Uh, if we have n nodes in the tree, uh, how about finding the minimum of a balanced search tree? Peter? Should be big O of log n. Why big O of log n? Because you can cut it in half every time, and then that you just go down the left pass. Yeah, we just keep following left, uh, left children until there aren't any more. Uh, and we're going to go through log n nodes to do that. So uh, there are kind of trade-offs here. Our, our balance tree um, is not constant time in anything, but does, uh, uh, does do pretty well. And the new data structure that we're going to talk about is called a heap. And uh, to be more specific, we are looking at a a binary min heap. We're going to have a heap, which is going to be a tree structure, and it's binary. Each node will have zero, one, or two children. Uh, it's going to keep track of the minimum, as opposed to you might also have a max heap that just just keeps track of the maximum rather than the minimum, and our Heap is going to also be log in. So you might ask, well, why do we need something new if it's not better than our, our binary search tree? Uh, but there are a few, uh, a few reasons why you would use this in practice. Our heap has Uh, great constant factors just means like it's it's sort of at our like big O level is log n, but in practice it will actually be faster than our binary search tree. Um, and if elements are added to our heap in random order, as opposed to some sorted order, but if they come in in random order. our add is going to be constant time on average, assuming we, we add nodes in random order. And so that, that, will be, that will be quite nice. So what is a heap? Uh, this term heap, kind of, you can think of it as uh, we're going to have a tree that is just going to keep track of the minimum and kind of not uh, uh, not keep our data completely in order in the way that our binary search tree does. Uh, and so in that sense, there's sort of something at the top of the heap and then kind of a jumble underneath it. Um, and so uh, heap kind of, I guess, to me, communicates this sort of, it's kind of somewhat, it's not as kind of nicely ordered as our, as our search tree. And uh, that's going to make it more efficient for particularly things where we just care about the minimum. So let's write down some properties 
So like uh, the binary search tree and the ABL tree, uh, we can kind of write down a couple, uh, a couple properties that make a particular tree a heap. One is the structure property, which says that it needs to be a complete binary tree, where complete has a very specific meaning. Um, if we have a tree <coughs> where for a tree of that height we have kind of all possible nodes, so kind of full, kind of filling out the full triangle is the way that I think about it. This would be an example of a full binary tree, and then a complete one. is one where we have the full tree kind of minus, but it, but it could be missing some nodes on the bottom row, but only missing them kind of from the right to the left. So uh, what I mean by that is that this is a complete binary tree, this is a complete binary tree, this is a complete binary tree, uh, and full kind of also fits the definition of complete. But for example, this right here, this would not be a complete binary tree because we can only be missing nodes kind of from the right end. We can't be kind of, some of them are filled in from the left. So if if our full says we have to have a whole triangle, our complete says we have the triangle kind of minus some chunk, some set of nodes along the bottom, but we can't have sort of a, a like we can't have this situation. It has to be filled in from, from left to right. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, our heap has to be a complete binary tree. We then have the heap property, which says I will say smaller, but in the context of a priority queue, smaller is higher priority, but every node is going to be higher priority than its descendants. So this is still imposing some order on the elements in our heap but not like everything to the left has to be less, everything to the right has to be greater. It's just saying like highest priority thing at the top. And this applies to kind of all, all subtrees, just like our other tree definitions, like the tree is a heap and then like the, the, the root is a heap and then its children are also the roots of smaller heaps. Elena. So the root is the highest priority thing. So why would, I, do you still have like the left being uh, you don't like that and that is going going to, the fact that we don't have to have things sorted to the left and the right is what's going to let us be more efficient for just finding the minimum than our binary search tree so I just want to uh, quickly put some examples of what our heaps would, would look like um, and then we'll, we'll finish up with heaps next time uh, but Um, this
this would be a valid binary min heap. As our, our root is the smallest, and uh, smaller than all of its children, and then if we look at each of those descendants, that descendant is itself smaller than all of its children. And it's a complete binary tree because we're only missing nodes kind of along the bottom, um, uh, bottom set of leaves. If uh, we had um, 60 here and 20 here, this would not be a valid heap because this, uh, again, this 60 would have to be smaller than all of its descendants and, and that would not be, not be true of this. So this would be an example of something that's not a heap. Does that make sense? Questions on we have our, our heap property and our structure property? All right, that'll be all we have time for today. Next time we'll talk about how we actually add and remove things from this structure and maintain these properties in an efficient way. Uh, you can find the, the quiz uh, code linked from, from Moodle. I have office hours tomorrow night, uh, and I'll see you Friday.